John has been a friend for many of us in this room for a long time, um, and certainly for me, a significant mentor in terms of what it is to think about data systems, to understand the bigger picture, to think about how we can maybe extract data more effectively. Um, one of the things that I have always admired in John is his ability to try and look outside of any kind of traditional box and think about another way that maybe we can push the envelope. Um, a lot of your work on um, iPads tools have made all of our jobs much easier. And that's something that I have appreciated every time I get out there and try and do an iPads analysis. That's the fundamental understanding of how can we take this giant data set and make it something that not only can a really good geeky analyst figure out where the fields are and what we're going to be able to pull out of this, but to create an executive peer tool that allows uh, at another level, um, extraction by somebody who doesn't want to have to get into that kind of detail, doesn't have to want to have to do giant downloads, but instead it's going to be able to ratchet it up and bring in pieces of information that are already packaged. The migration has been really speedy in terms of the tool sets, and it's very much in part. Um, due to people like John Milam who have really thought about how we can put that together. So that's um, a great deal of thanks on my part um, for us as a profession. The other thing is I've had a couple of conversations this year um, in terms of describing, well, how did you get John to come to Laramie? And the answer is I asked. Um, <laughs> some people have said, well, I'd like to be able to get John's entire thinking process down on a hard drive so that maybe I'd be able to do that. I think we have at least one person, Mike, who's been charged with coming back with as much of that as possible. <laughs> Mike Ellison. Um, Carrie had told me that she thought that uh, she, this was a task that he needed to come up with while he was here. <laughs> no. So, um, at this juncture, I'd like to turn over um, our presentation to John Milam, and we're going to talk about all sorts of things with business intelligence analytics and where we are headed. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Is the mic going to be there? Thank you, Dr. Joe Schaefer, for your kind words, and particularly the encouragement for the profession, which is, was really invaluable, particularly in terms of telling us we could come to the table and that you actually value what we were doing. And, and I, I think it's, it's that kind of leadership, it's that kind of focus on analytics, of knowing we can't do things the same old way, we're not moving the, the needle, that is really, really important. And one reason I wanted to be here, I want to thank uh, Lisa Muller, been a friend for a long time. There are a number of you, um, Hans Lorange, uh, Mark, and others in the room that have been very good friends and mentors to me. Uh, Archie and others have done wonderful work. So I, I was grateful for the opportunity to come here. I've never been to Wyoming. I always wanted to do that. And I, uh, I really am grateful for the chance to think about these things. And I did something I never do, which is I, I made an outline. It's, it's going to about eight pages. It's, it's, a, it's a short book now. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me. Plus, also, I get to show off my iPad. I took all the words that I had written up for this talk, and I put them into one of those nice little widgets on the web that makes these little graphics. And I looked at it, and I said, OK, what's this saying about my talk? And I said, I'm talking about data, learning, IR. And um, I don't really know what I'm saying, <laughs> except it's very pretty and it gets my attention, and I can stare at it for a while. And it's kind of uh, symptomatic of the whole issue about data warehousing and business analytics, is I can make a lot of pretty things, and I can get it, and I can dynamically generate it, but it doesn't necessarily 
uh, mean anything. And it's not, as, as uh, Dr. Schaefer pointed out, uh, actionable. It's not something I can actually make a decision on. And that's something I've been very more uh, aware of uh, being at the institution level. I've had some nice opportunities to be in a lot of different places. And this has been an incredible journey to work at a community college at this time with issues facing higher ed, but particularly community colleges. Um, and I run a one-person office, just so you know, and I'm an iPads key holder. Uh, my first reaction in thinking about business and intelligence and analytics is that, boy, these people haven't been paying attention to institutional research or literature or all the things we've done. And, and I have a knee-jerk reaction. It is that people are just wanting to do that same cycle about performance measures that we saw 10 years ago and that they, it's great they want dashboards, it's great they want visualization, but there's no recognition of all the hard work, the 50 years of the association, 51 years of the association and the literature and the knowledge base and intense issues like induced course load matrices and a lot of things that have developed with the work of Peter Ewell and others on learning outcomes and Trudy Banta and there's just no focus on that and it makes me feel like it's fluff. And I remember back when uh, W came out with the White House scorecards and he had the 15 agencies with these red, yellow, and green stoplights. And I said, that is dumb. <laughs> and I, it's not that I don't want him to look at those agencies. It's just that that's such a simplistic way of viewing the world. And I, you know, I, it really bothered me that they were throwing out all these complex cost of instruction models for state resource allocation and putting in place these quick performance measures that based on FTE productivity or some such thing, not even by discipline, they were going to award this much money. And you know, that's how it seemed at the time. But I was wrong, and I'm going to talk about why I was wrong and the lessons I'm learning today about a deeper phenomenon I think is going on. I don't know if like you, you talk about getting the emails. I get this one from MicroStrategy about once or twice a day. Uh, trying to invite me to a seminar, and they're in Virginia, and they know I'm in Virginia from uh, my IP address, and they focus in on that, and they send me these invites. And I know about business intelligence, and I had the opportunity to, to write a chapter on it with John Rome and John Porter for the Handbook of IR. That's not a plug. You should buy it, though. It's worth the <laughs> 70 bucks. I don't get any royalties. We got three free copies. Boy, they weigh a lot. It's hard just carrying them home. But we see this nice graphic, and we see this nice graphic coming out of EDUCAUSE and the folks that uh, are talking about analytics that just show the fact we've moved from a focus on how, what happened, to why did it happen, to what's going to happen, to how do we influence what's going to happen. And that has been the move and the growth, and we've seen that. And, and much of the work that I've done and others is still back in the 80s. And I, I always like to say I'm using 10 to 20 year old technology very effectively. But there's some that not. We talked about uh, the store that you were buying things for your truck at. The same's happened when the presidential elections. And Operation Narwhal is the Obama camp's version of it. But the level of data mining, the level of intense scrutinization of voter level registrations, of demographic patterns, of socioeconomic, of GIS data in order to mobilize volunteers, in order to mobilize funding, is absolutely phenomenal because these people understand that data is the key power and the tie into social networking as well, which I'll talk about more later. And if you haven't paid attention to where the literature on BI is going, you can do any of the introductory courses. The Data Warehouse Institute has been doing one. Uh, there are 50 different pieces of the puzzle that are put together in this, this little chart here. And we can focus on master data management, we can focus on data administration, stewardship, and they're all good things to learn. But they kind of blur the issues a little bit for me. Educause does a nice job. They've done a recent study on that. I'll talk about more, but they've done one a couple years ago that looked at where people see the growth in business intelligence and analytics and what they're looking at. And what they really want, and I'm sorry if you can't see the screen, uh, there are copies of the handouts, et cetera, and they'll be on the, the website for those who need to look at them closer. Uh, is the focus on key performance indicators. The top level on a one to five scale rating. I use a 4.4 choice myself, but that's never mind. Uh, 
dashboards and reports are second. And the third is really alerts, because it's one thing to be seeing the data. It's one thing to have stoplights. It's one thing to have these gauges. It's another to know when there's a break point, where there's something that we really need to be paying attention to. And those alerts are the third highest, and really those three cluster of what people are looking for in BI analytics. Another study, BiEducause out about a month ago, analytics in higher education. It's interesting. Enrollment management is at the top, finance and budgeting. These are the things of what people want analytics about. Then you go to what the benefits are. And the fact is, they're going to understand enrollment. They're going to understand changes in dynamics in students. They want to understand and respond to issues about data transparency and sharing the data. It's interesting faculty performance is down at the bottom. Hmm, I wonder where that is. Uh, the last graph that came out of that report that I really found interesting and I was learning for is what's in place. <laughs> interesting enough, and, and you do reflect this uh, value, is it's the interest of senior leaders who want to see these things because they know it's not working the way it is. The focus on key audiences, of key stakeholders, and what they're interested in, what they want to do, data capacity. But I want to show you at the very bottom of the scale, analysts. The people like us in the room who actually know how to do this stuff. And right up above it, they don't want you to see that line, funding. So let's think about that. There are a number of things, though, that if we link back, we've been doing that are business intelligence and analytics for many years. I mean, we've been working on the display of complex data and presenting it in different ways since the beginning of the World Wide Web in 1993. And I was fortunate to be around at that time doing IR and showing people how to write HTML, how to put up static pages, how to put up, face, how to put up fact book pages, not Facebook pages. We weren't doing that at the time. Uh, if we had only invested. Um, and to essentially revamp the entire workload because in the early 90s we were so swamped there was no way we could keep up with the work and we said we have to use these new electronic resources to make sense of the world, to get people the information they need. And we did a wonderful thing that we really enjoyed all those searching. We enjoyed all those hours on the computer. Um, for 10 years I did internet resources for institutional research because I just absolutely uh, was addicted to uh, searching and finding resources that justified my existence. <laughs> and I appreciate you all for reading those, uh, those pages and the thousands of links that we posted up. There are now tens of thousands and, and millions of links that are pertinent, and it's an undoable task. I've been thinking about doing it for business intelligence and analytics, though. The other thing is that we haven't just built static pages and fact books and office websites, is we've been building data-driven applications. We've been doing that. I was fortunate enough using tools in building data marts and data warehouses from scratch with Access and SQL Server and Cold Fusion, um, ASP, .NET. Um, there are people using PHP and MySQL. We had our own servers. And it was in the era that John Rome and John Porter and I and others were really just trying to show this is the way to keep up, putting stuff into data warehouses. And, and the end result is what we think of as business intelligence. And I was very fortunate uh, through the kindness of folks like Hans Ranch and others to be much more involved in iPads and ANSYS SHIO network uh, for a number of years. And as uh, Lisa kindly mentioned, to be involved in building some of the iPads tools, doing a, a kind of a sense-making site called Answers, accessing national surveys with electronic research sources. We did a project. Uh, 1999 called Violin, Voluntary Institutional Online Information Network, finding out what you wanted. And as a result, we did the common data set exchange of sharing common data sets, CDSX data. And, and we've done a number of those things. And there really was a vision of using the new tools out there to get data. Uh, more recently, uh, I was able to build a SIP 2010 sites and SIP Wizard and tools like that, and we did a thing called the iPad State Data Center, which was our most recent tool, which had a short-lived life on the ICE, on the NCS website. I won't go there, but um, if you ask for it, it will come back. No, uh, it won't. 
because there are many other good sites, including the ones at Shio and NGEMS and others, where you can get state-led data. But we all were doing that, and I've worked on data warehouses, and we've worked on that because that was the way to go, to take those static pages, to build data applications, to make them available, to let people get customized data, to see the data they needed in uh, real time using the, the, uh, the report structures that made sense to them. And at the same time, though, we were so passionately interested in all the changing technology. And you, you encourage us to think about the technology and to be using those tools. And there's some of us who do love that new set. And I'm playing with my iPad, but I waited for the iPad 3 because I wanted that retinal display. And I'm already bummed that there's an iPad 4 coming out that I'm <laughs> not going to have money for in my budget. Thank you. But, but I tell you, when the web was coming out, I started seeing online courses at George Mason. I started teaching online courses, and I taught online doctoral courses at University of Virginia on using data and data applications for administration. And part of my interest was costs and assessment, whether those online co courses were doing what they were supposed to be and what they cost to do. And fortunately, I was an institution that didn't care what the cost was because they wanted to be seen as a leader in the use of that technology. And we built the stuff from scratch, and it was before WebCT and Prometheus and before Blackboard bought up those companies and became a behemoth. And now we see some of the same things happening with Coursera, with Moogs, and we see the entire world breaking apart to the point where we have a, a national story about UVA and a president being ousted because of perceptions that she wasn't paying attention to changes in technology and that the window was going to close shut. And if they didn't act now, they were left out of the picture. And MIT and Berkeley and the rest of them were all going to gobble it up. And we felt the same way 10, 15 years ago with online courses and the delivery. It's changing dramatically, especially with Collaborate and all the different types of interactions that you can have. And it's not a 15-week sequential model like we were used to. Now, the same thing is happening in the field of business intelligence. And what we're seeing is Visual Tableau, MicroStrategy, Zogo Tech. We're seeing SAS data warehousing. We're seeing ProClarity, Cognos, Web Focus, OBI, and Obi-Wan Kenobi tools, <laughs> just like we were seeing them. And they're all out there. And they're all just like the cowboys that were there in the early 90s talking about the internet and selling you servers and HTML editors and all that. And it's a fun time to be doing IR because there's so many new tools out there. I know from building them that the vendors don't understand. And a lot of it you do have to do from scratch because it's one thing to talk about putting in a data mart on finance. It's quite another to understand the account structures and the roll-up of division codes and account codes. And if you try to marry finance and student data together, you just can't do it. And I've done it all from scratch myself. And I've had a lot of bright students. I've taught the basics who've then gone around to run circles around me because I'm a sloppy programmer. But I do like the vision of the thing. And I think that's what we all have to do, is, although you're hopefully better programmers. And I think we've now seen Kimball, Inman, and others, John Rome, write about data warehousing, write about the evolution of data systems and all, that there's really no excuse for us not having done our homework and, and needing to do all those things from scratch. Um, and what we find is that there's really so much work to do from using the clearinghouse, doing transfer studies, reverse transfer studies, uh, looking at all the key issues that we can't not use the technology effectively. And we have to do it. One of the other things we've talked about is, is the intense focus on state level student unit record data. I had the great opportunity to be the prime contractor for the iPad's student unit record feasibility study or as we like to call it, the National Student Database, or barcode, barcode on your forehead project. And you know you succeed when Congress specifically forbids the project by law. <laughs> Thank you. We did it. That was a great thing. Um, I was really hopeful for gainful employment. 
because I thought they were finding another way for the Department of Ed to slip in a national student unit record collection. And they have it. And they have five years of completions and five years of enrollment. So don't believe they won't do it because they know exactly what's happening and they got everybody in there except some that just weren't in financial aid programs. It's an amazing thing that's happened. But we've all benefited, particularly from the work of Peter Yule and his associates and Hans Larange and his associates in looking at documenting states, helping states build the ideal state unit record system and looking at those. And, and out of those years of work of NCHEMS, uh, data element dictionaries and Chess and Thomas and Mark Chisholm and others who've done wonderful work helping us envision what's possible. We now have SEDS, Common Education Data Standards, at 3.0 is the current version. Looking at what we know about data structures so we can pull it from one end of the continuum, K-12, PK-12, ATN, ANTF, whatever, all the way up to higher ed and into the workforce and lifelong learning and retraining and the Post-Secondary Education Standard Council and the rest of it. So we have all these new things about getting up metadata and standards and aligning them with policy issues. And part of this is happening because of the state longitudinal data systems, which I'll go into more in a minute, but it's just the intense focus on transparency. And we see things happening like the, the U.S. Senate with the, the bills that are being talked about with a student right to know before you go act in which they're forcing data to be collected more at the state level in, in terms of responding to some of these issues that are being, not being addressed necessarily with the SLEDs and the rest of that. And they're pushing to complete College America and the big goal of Lumina and the White House goals and the rest of it. And they're wrestling with lots of intense issues right now about student identifiers and de-identifying de and ways to share them across agencies and the rest of it. And there's so much being done in terms of feedback back to K-12 and to thinking about data structures. All this within the context of that intense focus on SLEDs and on student unit record data. And, and we have to be looking at state level policies and embracing it, whatever is occurring in our state, whether we like it or not because of the issues they're doing about the alignment of K-12 and higher education and whether our students coming out of high school are college ready and where they have large numbers of developmental needs. And we have 50% or more coming out with developmental needs. And we have a misalignment. And we can look at CalPASS and we can look at some other models where people have had high school and college faculty get together and look at the problems and the alignment of the curriculum. And, and it comes down to, you know, I've recently shared college readiness data with the president to share with our superintendents. And they're still not going to be able to respond because they're still having to teach to the test because they're still held accountable from standards of learning. So there are a lot of things and a lot of interesting state data policy issues going on that we have to be paying attention to. And at the same time, there are lots of measures. There are lots of things coming out in terms of what achieving the dream, what SEDS and others are promoting in terms of policy issues uh, to continue that conversation. Because Peter Yule, uh, the Community College Research Center out of Columbia, and, and many other projects funded by Gates and Lumina, uh, Ford, Mellon, and other foundations, some of which I have received money over time, thank you, um, are doing to promote a better understanding of student success, particularly a lot of it having to do with community colleges. And, then at the same time in the four-way world, thanks to the work of Christine and others in terms of looking at the student learning outcomes, the, the impact models, a lot of those accountability, transparency issues, and the evolution as we've seen of uh, VFA, VSA, the UCEA for the two-year, the four-year, and the private versions of these accountability or transparency um, models. And you know, we can, we can pick apart them for how difficult they are to collect the data or whether they're pie in the sky or whether they understand momentum points or milestones or whether we could ever hit a tipping point as uh, we, we've been kind of had a vision of how we could do those. And the problem is that they are showing us the way, but they're not doing it for us. And, and we're the ones who have to actually learn from those studies we have to pay attention, we have to replicate them in our own longitudinal data sets, 
And we have to be able to look at what does that mean for our institution? What is that saying that we're still, you know, using complete college America, only seeing 10% of part-time students complete? What does that mean about the, the agenda and the promise that we're making to our students? We are not going to be able to control the conversations that are coming out about SLEDs this month. And we had some of the first release in Virginia of uh, post-secondary to workforce as part of that Virginia longitudinal data system. And Todd Mass and others have done an incredible job building that piece of it. And the K-12 side's coming out with theirs and there are other things folded in. There are many states around the country, all of them happen to get stimulus money, are having to build these systems. And they're all poised to start releasing results. And you talk about the need for business intelligence and analytics. In the context of those discussions, they're going to be coming down on us like a very, very heavy hailstorm and saying, well, what does that say about you? What do you mean that your graduation or retention rates are 4% by this program and that your success rates and your average salary is lower than the average for students who didn't go to college? Or maybe it is. And there are a lot of issues there. Fortunately, there are some good practices, and NCS is good about not putting out data with you know, fewer than 10 cell sizes. We've got some things in terms of looking at five-year rolling averages on things, and I've gotten into the data myself. Uh, but it's really important to think about what that's going to do to the conversation and how prepared we are to look at it, because it's coming out. It's going to have data on our school, and it, we're going to have to respond to it. Now, part of the response is about workforce, because we've been talking about high schools for a while, and we've got college readiness, and we've got the disconnect, and we understand underprepared, and we understand those things. But the things that we have the hardest time, and we really have a great big unknown, have to do with workforce. Now, we're seeing studies out like this one out of the air, professional file, in terms of the movement of students coming out of majors going into industries. And you know, as I know, it's very hard to take SIP 2010 or 2000 codes and map them to the NAICS industry codes. That you really need SOC codes. We all love SOC codes because they're being used for iPads HR now. Um, and they should be, but we, we have to start using them. But we're going to crosswalk between SIP and SOC and NAICS. And this was done for this thing, which you get these reports and they really don't mean a lot to you. And this nice, data visualization tools shows me the movement, say the reds are from college transfer programs into many different disciplines. So it just shows you where folks are going to and you get some sense of the alignment of whether they're going into the field of study, which is oddly enough something in gainful employment. So we should be paying attention to it and they know it because they've been giving the for-profit sector heck about it, and they, they should, but we all have a problem, and the community college data are not necessarily any better than the for-profit on that. This is my SHEO site, the State Council of Higher Ed in Virginia, where they've released some post-completion. An example of it, it was embargoed until a couple days ago, it was taken offline and re-released today, or yesterday, and it gives me breakouts where I have enough graduates in the fields to show what their average salaries are using five-year rolling moving averages, I can do what they tell you not to do, which is to start comparing them to other schools. And they say, don't do that. They put it in the training. It's the first thing my president wants me to do. So let's just face facts. We're going to do it. Thank you. That said, I've been getting the unemployment data. I love working at a college where I can get the data, all the data I want. Thank you very much. And some of the things I can do is this study, which looks at trends of graduates and essentially, I'm looking at the percent increase of their average salaries, uh, taking out the outliers, like people who are under 2000 a quarter, because that's not really a living wage, and there are lots of ways to gauge that. And I can show that I do have significant, and I'm not doing a t-test for that, but I have noticeable frequency change of before and after year of graduation. And I look at multiple years, and I can do it for those programs that I have it in. I do the same thing for non-completers, people who are no longer in attendance at the institution, and I look at the change before and after their year of enrollment. Tough, tough charts to do. I'd much rather the state do it for us, but I gotta be prepared with my own data. One of the things we do, though, is use tools like Jobs EQ and other things, community profiles, and, and the GIS stuff is great for getting at the same kind of thing, that look at employment-related issues. 
and they look at our labor inventory, the unemployment by occupation, and the rest of it, because there's so much data. They also give us a really nice dashboard. Um, there are new reports coming out for this example uh, based on the SOC codes and the industry codes that are showing where I have high needs for training, percentage tied to uh, level of college, and also where I've got shortfalls in the jurisdiction that I've set of counties and cities for my college. So then I can begin to anticipate where I'm going to be needing to train more folks in the coming five years based on this. The thing about GE is that the focus on percent employed in field, salaries, and debt burdens is shown up in HEOA, it's shown up everywhere, and it's not going to be going away. So we have to be paying attention to it. We have to be following these kinds of templates when it gets resolved by the courts or not. But we need to be doing these things anyway and looking at these issues because this is the dynamic of what the Senate's you know, attacking the for-profits on with its four volumes of studies of them, what's coming out uh, in state legislatures, it's coming out uh, nationally with the uh, Right to Know Before You Go Act and things like that. We've talked a couple times about the big needle. People have mentioned it and the rest of it. And we've got the big goals from the White House, from the completion arch, and the other efforts to keep track of the data. And we've benefited enormously from the data quality campaign, from the work of Achieving the Dream, from the work of SHIO and NCHEMS and others to help us get clean data. And we know that that big goal is coming. We know that the White House is putting out a scorecard for every institution, for every state, and they're coming out, and they've been coming out. And we know that they're putting out performance measures. Um, and we know that we're all using the lessons of achieving a dream. We're using the lessons of Nessie and Ceci and Harry and Harry's brother and everyone else <laughs> to look at where we can move the needle and what's moving the needle. And it's interesting. You can see Arnie Duncan's and President Obama's experience in Chicago coming out with increasing the percentage of FAFSA takers and ways to do it. And you say, well, why are they doing that? It's because they increase FAFSA takers to get more full-time students. So you get the resources to do it. If you're full-time, you're more likely to graduate. If you're part-time, just you're out of luck. But we're not going to tell you that because we don't want to have that conversation. And we don't, because it's very tough to look students in the face and say, you know, you're not going to finish if you go this way, but you can enroll for a course. Yeah, sure. The problem is student success folks like to create programs. We all like to feel good about ourselves. We like to do stuff. We like an intervention. We want to do something, please. And I found that they get very tired of me. Especially when I say, well, you know, you, that's a great project. It's about a good thing to do, but you're not going to move the needle. If you want to move the needle, let's talk about XXXXX. And this is what they're doing. And what they are doing are some very clear things. And part of them is uh, moving people to uh, full-time attendance. They're moving to people to do better in the first four weeks of class. They're taking student development courses. They're making sure they're enrolled for online courseware. And we have data on those things. They're looking at key courses in the undergraduate career where we're losing lots of students and not retaining them after that course. So different types of retention models. Uh, we're looking at a lot of different issues. And all those have to be teased out by cohorts and things like that. And at the same time, when we're understanding that we're not moving the needle, we're saying, OK, but we got to track all these data. And we got all this pent up energy. So let's start visualizing it. Let's start playing. And we got OBIE tools, and we're doing data visualizations where we're saying, OK, they don't want to look at the numbers. Let me give them some nice, pretty things to look at instead. Visual Tableau, you essentially suck in any data set, but you can't substitute for knowing the work that you've already done. And I, I used mine against SAS. I'm sorry, I had to say that. That SAS guy here didn't pay me to say that. But I use Visual Tableau against SAS because I can make sure that I'm pulling in my merges and doing everything right instead of doing it in Tableau. 
But then I can use a variety of filters, and this is a web browser version of that report where I can look at full-time, um, where I can look at the campus, I can look at a variety of things, delivery mode, things like that. MicroStrategy, Truth in Advertising as a free tool. They're taking it off this week and bringing it back up again uh, out of the beta version where I can bring it in. All the BI tools are going to do the same thing. That's because the data are the same. They're look, making you ask and look at the data and defining dimensions, defining measures, and knowing how to array them so that you can drill down. That's the beauty of online analytic processing. That's the beauty of doing cubes. And we do course visualizations. In this case, I'm looking at productivity of uh, online courses by two different campuses. I'm looking at percent capacity of online courses where I can look at online for a certain campus. I can look at certain subjects, full-time, part-time faculty, uh, different divisions of schools, et cetera. And the same thing exists in Oracle with BI Publisher where you can create these, just like the visualizations, you create low gauges and dashboards and all those things that we love to make fun of about stoplights and uh, the W's uh, 15 agency scorecard. And Don Turkla for Air Professional filed, I guess it was a professional file, yeah, Air Professional file. You get confused with resources and applications, both of which are wonderful things to look at. Um, did a survey of all the key data that are being used in dashboards. And, and you know what's funny is that there's no one set dashboard, even by sector or control, uh, that is showing up. And there are lots of things. There are financial indicators, there are admissions, enrollment, faculty down. And she shows which are more popular. And you can, can get into the weeds and look at that. We all have different models of what we'll look at for dashboard. We have vendors that will show us their vision of how to track it. We have vendors that will show us what not to do in a dashboard, but we can do it, and we can do it very quickly, thank you. Um, and John Rome and others have done a great job. Uh, Stephen Few, Tufty have wonderful models about visual display, and there's no su substitute for having that same common sense and using good lessons about the visual display. But, but many times what we're seeing are spark lines and bars and stack bars and all that give you a, w a way to quickly assess things that care about for you and let you then drill down further to look at it. So that's dashboards. You know, I think it would be okay if I hadn't heard Trudy Banta speak a few years ago. He basically said that all college impact studies were worthless. Ex except the one that Christine's talking about, which are okay. <laughs> I say that kindly because there are very clear prescribed ways to use the COA and to use some of the other measures that they've spelled out and where to do new students versus transfer students and cohorts and full time and the rest of it. So you've got to do it well. But what we learned is that most of these studies were badly done and that there are so many multivariate variables to pay attention to that there's no way we can be doing pre-post testing unless we're doing it well and we're using defined instrumentation and we're following the model. And there are vendors from Nessie on down who would love to sell us an approach. And those are all great conversations to have, but there are a couple of things that I've learned and that is you cannot do cross-sectional studies. At a point in time, picking two different, you know, graduates and new freshmen and expect to learn anything. They, they're trashed. Passerelle, Terenzini, and Aston have trashed them. And we need to pay attention to not doing them. The other thing is that the focus has changed from value added to improving teaching and learning, which is what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. So we have to really be wondering why I was so fixated on compass to cap and other changes when, yes, for a tiny part of the population, I can replicate those studies and compare against peer data and learn some things. But most of the time, I can't really do it. And I recently was in a, a state conference with uh, the people from Madison Assessment, and they're selling a oral communication tool and other things and other ones. And I'm looking at their assessment things and asking them questions and about these cross-sectional and how you can't do value add. And they say, you're absolutely right. But you can compare students who are, say, 70% of the way in through their gen ed requirements with those who are not taking their gen ed requirements. 
and, and you use that as one of a triangulation of methods to see what the conversation says about these students. So we have to, we've learned that we have to resist the temptation to fall into quick, easy solutions about impact. And that we have to be very careful with those studies, particularly with regression to the mean, uh, when there's not much variation for students who are already doing well, and also with propensity. Uh, and propensity having to do with the interventions, because it's, it's great to create a new program like learning communities or the high impact practices that are promoted by Nessie and Sessie and, and, and Kay and others, but it, it's very hard to know whether they actually had any impact. And, and there are studies that are being done well with it. The Kingsborough Community College study right now where they had control groups was a great way of looking at the impact of learning communities. But it showed that the communities really didn't change much the first couple years. You had to wait five or six years to see a true difference in those cohorts of what was happening. All right, I'm moving on. If you've been paying attention and you're thinking about all the things that are going on, big data are here. We're getting a flood, a complete exaflood of data and it's not just the data out of our student information systems and our non-credit and our learning management systems and our events management and equipment and trust and faculty workload and faculty spectrum of other things. The fact is that we've built data marts, we've built data warehouses, we're looking at business intelligence tools, but we'd be remiss if we weren't thinking about the fact that everything has changed because it's not the same as it was 10 or 20 years ago. The, bandwidth of electronic data alone, and this is a few years old, is so beyond anything we can even comprehend that all of our assumptions about data, all of our assumptions about what we focus on in business intelligence have to be questioned as obsolete. And we may not be doing anything except reinforcing lessons we learned in graduate school. It's a nice little cartoon out of Dilbert. This is for educational use only just so you know. But essentially, for those of you who can't read, it says, consultants say the quintillion bytes of data are created every day. It comes from everywhere. It knows all. According to the book of Wikimedia, its name is Big Data. <laughs> Big Data lives in the cloud. It knows what we do. In the past, our company did many evil things. But if we accept Big Data in our servers, we will be saved from bankruptcy. <laughs> Let us pay. <laughs> and the lady says, is it too late for us to side with evil? <laughs> and shh, it hears you. So it's gone. <laughs> you know, right now, what we've been trying to do is like trying to run underwater across the pool, loaded down with notebooks of stuff. The data come in. They're huge silos. We might do extraction, transformation, and load, pulling them in, put them into data marts. We go against the data marts or data warehouses, create other data marts and other data objects. We've got queries, we've got dashboards, we've got analysis, OLAP cubes, and the rest of it. But the fact is, we can't keep up. We, have, we can't keep living in the dream like it was 10 or 20 years ago. And it's here. Now, we can keep putting out our fact books. But we have to think about what happened to print media. Newspapers don't exist the way they did anymore. They're much smaller. They don't exist. Times-Picayune in New Orleans may not even be there. The, the whole era of print media is gone. And you can see it in our libraries. You can see it in everything. And we have to think about what's happening with print media as a metaphor for what's happening with us and data. because. It's not just a matter of us putting out an ebook or a PDF version of our fact book or a searchable version of our fact book. We can't wait for SharePoint to share stuff across our intranet or the rest of it with hierarchical linear things. The way we get and process and use and share and distribute and create and annotate and revise information is not that way. We have to challenge all of our assumptions about it. It's too simplistic. Even the the menus, thank you, even the menus for it have changed. Part of the reason they've changed is that social media has changed us. 
Now you might think that social media is just for millennials, for those people who are in a certain age bracket who don't really know how to read and don't want to do the reading assignments for class and the English faculty are moaning about it. But it isn't. Something else is going on. And you can't get to these students with email. You have to get to them with social networking. And what we're seeing is that it's not just an afterthought. It's not just something that's going on. We're seeing a billion users. We're seeing seven billion visitors a month to Facebook. And this is not people who don't have anything better to do, who are just too young and don't know what they're doing with their lives. These are our sister-in-laws and our families and our kids and sometimes us. And it's not just, and, and one of the things I, I look at is the demographics of it, where there's certain, you know, the people with college degrees are a little bit less, but it's over the entire pool of Facebook, Twitter, MySpace. I like what um, Michael uh, Saylor, sorry about that, from MicroStrategy has been putting together about what social networks provide. They let us broadcast. They let us coordinate our social lives. Um, they let us uh, check the UPC on something at the store and then buy it cheaper through Amazon or somewhere else. And they have a whole way of guiding our universal identity and who we are. And part of it is because of the emergence of, of mobile computing. And it, it truly is what he calls a disruptive technology. When you look at the EDUCOS studies of what they wanted to do with mobile applications, the number one was dashboards. Number two was data visualizations. And third was alerts. They want to know what's wrong and when it is. They want to visualize the data and they want to be able to see it. The reason they want to see it the way they're seeing it and why mobile computing is that it's fun. It's shape processing. You know, it might just feel like we're playing Angry Birds. And the reason Angry Birds feels good is because something else is going on. Something else is going on with Angry Birds. And what they say is that it truly is a new way of processing. It's, and, and it's an old way, too. I'm sorry. It's an old way of processing visually that doesn't require literacy of m numeric and other signs. And, and there's something that's so much more fun of visual and tactile working with it. The uh, Horizon Report looks at mobile apps, looks at tablet computing, but they're also looking at the use of these applications such as data visualization. And this is Tableau on my computer. I have a link to my workbooks. I can see my workbooks. I can drill in. That one I did for a little bit ago on data visualization, I can see here. Uh, I can do quick filters. I can drill in on the filters and pick things. I'm doing all this on the iPad. And what we're finding is that that's part of the emerging analytics that have become to expect because of mobile computing, because visual processing is more fun, because of the social networking and the rest of that, and it's happening. There are other trends that are interesting to pay attention to, the movement of everything to the cloud, so the cloud follows you, your media, your other resources are there all the time, the collaborative work that's happening, the fact that our online course models are no longer the, the threaded discussion group with a couple of videos of Sage on the stage. Um, and they're moving to, the reason they like games so much is that they're challenge-based. They involve active learning and social networking and social groups. And the NMC just released a comparison of what's happening in STEM, education, higher ed, uh, over the next five years. And, and it's the entire teaching paradigm that's happening online that they're pointing to. Not just studying wherever, whenever you want, but using so many resources on the cloud and using them collaboratively, driven by your own need sets. It's made college obsolete. MOOCs and others have made it obsolete. It's visual processing. And the same thing, and this is really, I'm getting to my point, I will, I'm running a little late, I know, is that managers do things differently now. And it's not about the difference between IR work and operations. And we've learned from Tufty, and we've learned from his analysis of PowerPoint and the shuttle disaster that we're not well served by the hierarchical PowerPoint 
presentation of information. And that knowledge is much more ambiguous, much more holistic, much more amorphous, qualitative. And it's uncomfortable for us not to have our normal way of thinking about. But learning is going to be ubiquitous. The internet is ubiquitous. And we have to recognize that this makes us uncomfortable because we want a known world. We want our labels. We want the way things we want. People want data. They want it for all kinds of things right now, but they don't necessarily want IR data. They want operations data. They want data about the business processes that they're focused on, such as getting people enrolled, getting people paid, wait lists, backouts for non-payment, re-enrollment, drop bad dates, a variety of things, and that's just examples from the student enrollment side. And I worry they're not going to move the needle. They're not going to move the needle listening to me in my reports. They're going to move the needle focusing on business processes. The labels IR, IE, and assessment have served us to evolve the knowledge base and to think about what we do. But the problem is that when we think about mobile computing, the arrival of SLEDs, the lessons of SEDs, what we learn from everything from data quality campaign, the completion arch, the focus on state data, and all these things I've gone through is that there's absolutely no way to keep up. Big data are here. We have visualization tools and data, and they get too simplistic. Well, the fact is it's not necessarily that we just have to keep doing things the same way. We'll, we can't. We can't survive. We could do it. We'll keep our jobs because they need us. But we won't be happy, they won't be happy, and our institutions are not going to be well served. Part of it is that the, the labels we put on what we do are a construction of self. They are identities. They're fiction. They're essentially social construction that help keep our ego in check, that help keep our ego going. We put them on kind of like a Halloween costume. Oh, I'm an IR professional. I'm here at the conference. I'm teaching about BI. I feel so good about myself and my ego. And I go home, and I can rest on that for a while. And then I have to ask, well, what was all that about? Why did I do all that? What was I learning? What did it change? And, and I think part of it is that we don't like being uncomfortable. We don't like doing it. But you know, there are times when you've been really sick or you've gone on a really good vacation, or you've had some major ordeal, a death in the family, or something that forces you to see life differently. And that's what changes us. That's what forces us to make new connections and the rest of it. And we tell stories about it, and then we shut down, and we don't learn anymore. But for a brief time, we really have the opportunity to open ourselves up. And I think that truly is what's happening now with business intelligence and analytics. In the era of Facebook, social media, tablet computing, the cloud, SLEDs, data, DQC, DQC, achieving the dream, everything else. And I think that's where we have to go. And part of it is that the knowledge base that we cling to is not about a linear functionalist thing like we learn in graduate school. It's not cumulative. It's not functionalist. People don't use dashboards the way we think they do. They want to interact with them. They want to get visual processing. It wants to help them. They're so flooded themselves with data. And they want to be happy that we just want them to focus on the things that they attend to. And there are many, many different ways to do that. And there's a lot of work in front of us. And, and I am involved in visualizations of course data and enrollment data, data using GIS and zip code level data, course planning. I've talked, I can talk about a myriad of things, and I know I've run out of time, and I appreciate your patience letting me think about these things. In, in wrapping up, I guess I want to say there's a whole new ecosystem for BI that's happening. And there are new technologies, and we kind of need an entirely new information ecosystem, a new label. And it's becoming part of the core infrastructure of everything. It's just not something on the side anymore. And this is from a nice little talk uh, on BI uh, by Sawyer. And we're going to see Excel 2013 come out with a lot more BI things, all the things that are in Power Pivot, all the things that are in Report Builder and others in SQL Server that are free are going to be embedded in BI, and the tools are changing, and the tools are changing in every other product that we deal with.
So I want to thank you for your patience and the, grateful for the opportunity to think about these things with you. We have a time for questions after this in the next session, which I know I've cut into, but thank you very much.